Good evening and welcome to the Bible study here in Ballyclare Evangelical Presbyterian Church. We're glad if you're able to join us there this evening. We trust to know something of God's blessing and presence. Let's seek his face now together in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, our God in heaven, we thank you to return, to gather in your presence, to call upon your name, to know and to be assured that there is a welcome for us in the Father's presence through the Son and empowered by God the Holy Spirit. And we pray your grace and blessing once and again as we seek your face. Come down, O God, speak to us through your word, have dealings with our hearts, cause us to, to know and to feel our sin and our guilt, but cause us too to know the wonderful forgiveness and pardon in our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to read this evening in the first book of Timothy and in chapter 4 and then two verses from Hebrews and 13 verse 7 and verse 8. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 and at verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself toward godliness. For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance, for to this end we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the savior of all men, especially of those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to all the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given you by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will both save yourself and those who hear you. And then in Hebrews chapter 13 and at verse 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank God for the reading of his word. We'll come back to verse 7 and 8. But before we do that, we're going to turn, turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do so want to thank you for your goodness and love and care for us, all of which is completely, utterly um, undeserved. There's no uh, sense in which we have merited your love. Indeed, Lord, we've done everything to despise you, to grieve you, and to turn your love away. But we thank you tonight to be accepted in the Lord Jesus, to be accepted in the Beloved. And we thank you that we have that title. We're called the Beloved too, because of our belonging to him. We thank you for the Lord Jesus who entered the fray for us, who came into this world as a man. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that he did, for all that he accomplished, for all the perfections of his holy life. And we thank you then that he was to go to the cross at Calvary, there to be put to death, not for sin which was his, but sin ours counted to him. We thank you for the wonderful truth of being justified through faith in Christ alone. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to rest 
on that truth day by day. To affirm again, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Help us, Heavenly Father, to be conscious of our uh, complete and total indebtedness, to know that we've been bought with a price, to know wonderfully that we've been counted right with God, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. What a wonderful, wonderful truth. But help us, Heavenly Father, we pray that we may respond to that wonderful truth day by day and that we may endeavour uh, with all uh, our might, but with all the grace of God given to us to love you and to serve you and to honour you. Help us to flee um, unrighteousness, we pray. Help us to, to follow hard after the pathways of righteousness, that we may please you and honour you and glorify you. Lord, we fail you a million times over, but you're a gracious God. Remain gracious to us, we pray. And even as we meet tonight, come and reach out to us and have dealings with our hearts. We thank you for all that belongs to us in life. And especially, Lord, we think of our family. We treasure them. We love them. We long for them that each and every one of them however they're related to us, would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We think of little ones especially, and we pray that you would work in the hearts of our little ones, that they may come to know you, that they may see through this life, that they may see that there is eternal life with God through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, work in their hearts and have dealings with them, we pray. We pray that you would bless our time this evening. We pray for those who... Uh, we'll be able to gather in church uh, for the prayer meeting, those of us um, here, Lord, but those uh, who are unable to gather with us, Lord. And we pray your blessing and grace and goodness to be upon them. We ask you that you would help us, that whatever our situation in life, whether our days are happy ones, whether our days are tinged with sadness, that we would know the joy of the Lord to be our strength. So come down, bless your word to us, and remember us with loving kindness, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been in the book of Hebrews for something over a year now, and it's a, a wonderful, wonderful book. And the more that you come to know the book, the, the more I trust that you appreciate it and love it. And uh, the more it brings to your soul, the more it feeds your soul. Um, the writer book of Hebrews is writing to folk who had become Christians, but um, they'd known a setback. He's seeking to help them. He's seeking really to give them a, a leg up. They had a Jewish background. Um, their circumstances um, were uh, very powerful, I suppose, really, in that they'd come out of the Jewish faith and they'd found the Lord Jesus Christ. They'd made wonderful progress and they'd faced difficulties and troubles and they'd, they'd run with the Lord Jesus. But um, very sadly, they'd known opposition and difficulty. And over time, this had worn them down. The writer book of Hebrews is not coming um, here in a, a, a sense of uh, judgmentalism or anything like that. He's not in any sense being negative, though there are some very strident warnings in the book that we do well to take heed to. Um, and are certainly relevant to us in our day. But he's, he's really trying to be positive here and to give them a leg up to help them. He wants them to see that the Lord Jesus is God's supreme messenger, carrying God's supreme message. And the Lord Jesus is that one who is there representing us be, between um, man and God. He's the only one who can step in. He's God's supreme um, high priest, if you like. Um, the, the, the supreme saviour, the one that we need to look to. That's what they'd believe, but hard times had worn them down. And so the writer book of Hebrews is trying to help them. He points them to that long, long list of Old Testament saints in Hebrews 11, a chapter that we, we love and, and long, you know, re really um, joy to, to, to ponder. He, he points them in, in chapter 12 to the need to follow after the Lord Jesus. And, and we come then in chapter 13 to a series of very practical, um, I, I don't know, uh, directives really, I suppose, let brotherly love continue. Remember the prisoners and so on, marriage, he's dealt with marriage. And then last time we dealt with that issue of covetousness. And 
well, what a challenge that issue is, because certainly covetousness is to be found all around us in the world, discontentment. And we spoke of the great importance of contentment, joy from God in the Christian life, the pressure on contentment, the promotion of contentment, how are we to, to promote it, and the provision for contentment. The Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man can do to me. Now this evening, the writer book of Hebrews comes to um, urge them to, to think about the people who lead them. This version here has rule. Remember those who rule over you. But a better translation would be, remember those who lead you. And so um, really what we've got here tonight is about listening to leaders. It takes in both verses. I know oftentimes that verse 8 is treated separately and um, you know, it's sort of plucked out of the passage, really. And yes, it's a standing truth, so you can do that with it. But we're going to look at the truth tonight as it combines with verse 7 in its context. So the passage here tonight is about listening to leaders. Three headings. Follow your leaders. <clears throat> Follow your leaders. Follow their leadership. Follow their leadership. Follow their leader. Follow your leaders. People here who are leading, and especially this mention of those who have spoken the word of God. Follow your leaders, follow their leadership, and we'll think especially about the theme of example, and follow their leader, the one they're pointing to, the Lord Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. First of all, then, follow your leaders. Springing from childhood, um, there are games that I remember that as kids we played. Um, I'm sure there are probably a lot more that I don't remember, but um, there, was, there was a game called Tick. Sometimes people call that Tag, or uh, sometimes it used to go by the title You're On. Let's play You're On. And, um, you know, someone is the person who's on, they're the person who's trying to tick everyone else and so on. Hide and Seek, which is a game that still remains and still gets played with the children. Hopscotch, sometimes that used to be viewed as a bit of a girl's game, but we did. Um, even the boys used to uh, take a, a turn at Hopscotch, and you remember the markings on the pavement and, and, and so on. And another game, and I'm sure I've mentioned it on other occasions, is Follow My Leader. A game, really, of keeping up with whose ever turn it was to lead. Sometimes that would be on foot. Sometimes on bikes, you'd be climbing over this and jumping over that. Um, follow my leader. The writer of the book of Hebrews is anxious in verses 7 and 8 that his readers follow their leaders. Something very similar to this will come up in verse 17. So I, I'd better notice that now. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give a, a account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. So there's something similar in verse 17. Remember is the first word here. Remember those who rule over you. Be remembering. And um, if in verse 17 the command word is obey, here it's be remembering. And add to that, um, trying to distinguish between verse 7 and verse 17 and to see why there are two similar but obviously different verses, um, we, we've got the past tense. Remember those who lead you, who have spoken the word of God to you. And here um, is, you know, part of the sentence in the past tense, most definitely in the past tense. And so the distinction between verse 7 and 17, take remember, and the past tense, which do, I acknowledge, seem very similar, the, 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 the difference, the distinction would seem to be um, something of these perhaps being teaching elders, that, that may be the distinction, and ruling elders in verse 17, that, that may be the distinction. Or it may be that he's pointing to leaders who date into the past in verse 7, and leaders who are very much there present in verse 17. These folk were to be wise, and they were to ponder the words they had heard, the words that had been taught them. 
the words that had been laid up in their hearts by faithful leaders. They were to follow the lead that they brought. It, it may well be that in view here were those leaders who were very much in the past, that they first knew, as it were, in the faith, who first had had the responsibility of bringing God's word to them. We can't be exactly clear on that. I'm sure that we're, um, you know, many of us grateful for ministries which have spoken to us in the past and what a wonderful thing that is. And we perhaps remember certain distinctives and so on, things that they said, certain phrases that they would use. And those things are lodged um, in their hearts, certainly lodged in my heart, and I can remember different things and so on. And how wonderful that was. Notice how um, these people are marked out. They brought God's word. That's important because leading God's people is not about strong personality or a loud voice or a readiness to thrust yourself forward. Now, sad to say that leadership um, in, in general in society, and to some extent in the church, has become about those things. And it's about a strong personality. It's about a loud voice, he who shouts loudest and so on. Or it's simply about a readiness to sort of thrust yourself forward. And others far more capable are, are, are left behind. It's, it's not about those things. It's, it's rather, as we see here, about being committed and about following and bringing God's word. We'll emphasise the, the, the whole idea of um, following their faith in a few moments' time. Moses, you remember, um, is a particular example. And we've often pointed out that Moses was um, a very meek man. He, he, in many ways, was a retiring figure. He certainly didn't look to be the leader of the people of Israel. Yes, in his earlier days, he, you remember, had struck out and he had killed the Egyptian because of what was being done um, to his uh, fat fellow Jews and so on. But by the time that we meet him when he's 80 years old in the wilderness, he certainly does not want to lead the people of God. But wonderfully, of course, God raises him up. Um, and what a wonderful leader he will be. But he's hardly the kind of man that you would think of as eloquent. He says, well, I'm not eloquent. He actually says that, doesn't he? He's not eloquent. He, he's not a man to push himself forward or anything like that. No, his leadership is in his faithfulness. And we've seen that uh, term applied to, to Moses. Moses was faithful in all God's house. He conveyed what God said. He didn't meddle with it. Uh, he didn't inject his own ideas. He didn't come up with his own solutions. It wasn't his own sort of nimble wit and... Um, you know, it wasn't a case of, I'll tell you what to do. It was a case of, I'll tell you what God tells you to do. Here we are in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 25. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us. And that was Moses' emphasis. It wasn't about, you know, this is my um, thoughts on the matter. It was about, well, this is what God says. It was God's word. And these folk have been pointed to people who, it would seem, had been very faithful leaders, perhaps in the present, but it could well be in the past. And the emphasis here is on God's leadership through them. In view here, yes, clearly a man. And we have to say that God chooses in his providence to use men. And in that sense, men are um, very needful. God raises up men. God brings men um, and so on. You remember that the children of Israel, they didn't want to hear directly from God. They said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. Well, there's something quite particular to, to that situation in Exodus and chapter 20. But um, God does deal through men. And God's people here are to be reminded that they're to be careful to respect that leadership and not to reject it. Now, 
let's be clear, this is no uh, license to authoritarianism or to domination or to some ego trip mentality. All of those things very quickly arise in men. And, um, you know, with power comes the great danger, with leadership comes the great danger that people use that to exert, um, you know, their own authority, sense of authority. That, that they, they, they use that because they want to be in control, to, to be seen the, the big I am and so on. That is not what leadership in the Church of God is to be about. It's not about an ego trip mentality. Again, think of um, Moses. And Moses, we're told there in Numbers in chapter 12 and verse 3, was the meekest man on earth. And I'm sure you've heard me um, uh, sp speak in such glowing terms about that remark. That's something that you could want to be said of you. Again and again, when Moses was criticized, he kept his peace. In New Testament terms, he endeavored to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. He tried so hard to keep the peace. And uh, he was to plead, when you know, God said, well, that's it, I've had enough of these people. Moses would plead for them. What a remarkable man he was. We read of elders in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we read 4, but 3 of elders we read, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. Marked out by being gentle, marked out not by being quarrelsome, picking arguments and so on. Marked out because his children respect him and follow him. No man is perfect, but his children respect and they follow him. This isn't about egomania, and there's no, no you know, sort of place for that, and there's no excuse for that. God's people are to respect, they're not to reject. Now, of course, time and again, um, despite all, let's take Moses again, despite all that Moses was, sad to say that God's people rejected his leadership. It was a tragedy. Exodus 16, then the whole congregation of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Chapter 17, verse 2. Then, therefore, the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? It was all completely ridiculous. These people needed to think about the man. Of course, it's all God at the end of the day, but they needed to think about the man that they were dealing with and the grace that he had demonstrated to them. Chapter 14 of Numbers, verse 2, And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, if only had died in this wilderness. And this comes up again and again and again. So there again in chapter 16, and um, down at verse 2. And they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, uh, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. These were, you know, important men amidst the great congregation of Israel, but they were foolish to rise up against Moses. So this, this has happened. The, the argument here is respect, not reject. Respect not reject. And it's a matter, of course, let's be clear, of respecting um, for the sake of the role. It's about respecting the role, isn't it, ultimately? Um, here are the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 10. They're speaking about Paul. For his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. They've got things to say about Paul. It had come back to Paul. Paul knew about it. He was still gracious to them. He's been pretty firm there, but he, you know, he knows what they're saying. Paul wasn't a fool. He knew what they were saying. Again, chapter 11, verse 6, Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Now, 
what do you say? We're, we're not for one moment excusing um, men if they're going to, you know, leaders now, if they're going to be uh, stupid or daft or foolish or plain and simple wrong. We're not excusing that. But we've to be careful to respect. And if we move into reject, well, we've crossed a line, a very important line. And when God's people turned against their leaders who ought to have been respected, make no mistake about it, God moved in. And they turned against God. Respect is the tenor of these words. But follow is the command. Remember those who lead you or who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, follow. And um, the, the word follow here is in the present tense, be following. It comes from the word from which we get our English word mimic or mime. And in a mime, um, you don't speak, do you? You don't speak in a mime, but you follow through with actions. You play out, you uh, mime something. Um, you follow through with the actions, you don't speak. In the sense of imitate. Now let's be careful, not mimic in the sense of poking fun. But rather following. God provides leaders, but he expects his people to follow them. I read an article there last week um, that boiled down to, to, to this. Um, that uh, leaders are, um, you know, uh, afraid to, to lead because they fear they will not be followed. That's kind of the summation of what the article was about. That leaders have got to a position, it's not talking about church leaders, although it, it's, it certainly can apply to church leaders, um, but leaders have got to a place, wider society and so on, where they're afraid to lead because they fear they will not be followed. That is very definitely there in society today. And the danger from that, you see, is that leaders seek popularity. This whole phrase, populism, well, in, in a sense, it's, it's part and part of the story there, isn't it? There's a danger that leaders seek popularity. Um, the emphasis here seems to be on past leaders. They're to keep following their leadership as they brought God's word. So it's not about, you know, being dictated to or uh, following stupid leadership or um, following people's arrogance or, um, you know, <laughs> desires for ego and so on. It's not about that. There's no command to follow that. But they are to follow uh, the leadership of those who have exampled, whose faith has demonstrated their belief and trust in these things, they are to follow those who have brought God's word. So, follow your leaders. But notice then, follow their leadership. And the talk here is of our duty to follow those as God has given leaders, but we need to emphasize their, their role and responsibility. It's a God-given role. It's a God-given responsibility. That doesn't mean that people aren't people and that they don't get things wrong. They do. Even dear Moses got it wrong. And instead of um, speaking to the rock, he hit the rock. Paul would fall out with Barnabas. It looks very much as though he had every reason to fall out with Barnabas, but still I'm sure that he regretted in the longer term that there was this fallout. Peter was two-faced. Remember that Paul um, addressed him in the book of, or well, it's recorded in the book of Galatians. He spoke to him sort of nose to nose, face to face, and he, he told him straight out. So we're not saying that men are perfect and that men don't get things wrong. They do. Yet God chose to give and to use men in that role. We need um, especially to, to take to heart what we read in the book of Ephesians and chapter 4 and uh, verse 11. It's extremely powerful. Uh, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ who has ascended, 
He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. When we think of the church of God, it's God who gives men. And you see how serious that is, because ultimately, if God's people are going to pick an argument, they're picking an argument with God who gives men. I'm not saying that men can't get it wrong, they can. But ultimately, they're picking an argument with God. This is a God-given role. But emphasize the responsibility. Because this role of being a leader is a solemn task. They're answerable. There'll be something of that answerability in verse 17. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. There's an accounting. Um, to, 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 to be in a place of leadership. And I suppose we can uh, make that distinction between um, ruling elders and, and teaching elders and so on. But to be in a, a place of leadership comes with responsibility. Here's Paul writing in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Timothy's reminded that he's going to have to give an answer for his ministry. He wasn't to fold to consumerism. He wasn't to give in to what men wanted to hear. He wasn't to tickle their ears. No, he was to be faithful to God. Now, of course, ultimately, the um, responsibility for the outworking of what happens there um, to a large extent rests with God. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and, and what do we read? Well, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. But at the same time, we read um, his Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16, for if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. There's an answerability. And these men that the writer book of Hebrews are being taught to, to listen to their ministry, to watch their example, had a responsibility. Notice that the particular responsibility here is to set an example. They had spoken, but it was their faith. Remember those who rule over you or who lead you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith followed. These people were to exercise faith. They were to follow the faith of those who had gone, as it were, before them. Were they still around? Well, we don't know. It's hard to be clear whether it's all in the past tense. But they were to follow that example of faith. The Lord Jesus washes the feet, doesn't he? John and chapter uh, 13. And then verse 15 we read, For I have given you, or I'll read verse 14, If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, ought to also, or, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. They were to follow an example. Or Paul writes, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. There's a, there's a great deal, isn't there, um, you know, about imitating. Not mimicking in the sense of making fun, but imitating. Um, following the example. Here's Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us. They're a pattern. They were to follow the pattern. Patterns are so important, aren't they, in life? And you follow a pattern. If you had to reinvent the wheel every time that you do something, well, we'd be at it all day. Uh, so many of the things that we do are, are in terms of a pattern. We've done it before, we do it again. If we had to rediscover everything every day, oh dear, no, we follow a pattern. Now, be clear, it's not um, <laughs> here accent or mannerism. I've heard uh, folk over the years who have sort of had a, preacher look-alike to them. Um, so men who've spoken in the way that Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones used to speak. <laughs> it's almost as if they want to be like him. Or people who 
um, you've heard it, people who follow Donald McLeod, and it's almost as if they want to have the same turn of phrase and accent as Donald McLeod. Um, someone like, um, you know, like, like Reverend Herbert, Herbert Carson and, and people following him. I've heard all of those. It's not about, um, you know, following the way that they speak or their mannerisms or the way, you know, the intonation of their voice, anything like that. No, it's the working out and commitment to faith. And so in the broadest sense here, elders should be recognizable as providing an example. That's the first thing, really, when it comes to being an elder. Why in First Timothy, why in Titus um, do we read, when it comes to eldership, Titus in chapter 1, why is the primary thing example? Well, because example speaks, and the lack of example undermines. And if there's not the example to undergird, as it were, the speech, then the speech is going to come to absolutely nothing. That's true in all Christian service. Think of children and the work, um, you know, of YPAs and, and children's meeting and so on. If there's no example, how can you expect children to, to follow? Uh, it's not you're saying to children you need to pray, but you show that you've no real concern to, to pray yourself. That, that's going nowhere. It's no use, you know, having some important series of meetings and laboring the thought of praying, but you're not going to be concerned to be at the prayer meeting. That's, that's no example. That doesn't make any sense. Ultimately, children will get to hear. They'll read your example. And the same is true of, you know, Seeking first, we mentioned that on Sunday, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If, if that's not the way it is, then there's no use trying to say that to somebody else. It's going nowhere. Now, be clear, of course, none of us is perfect, that's for sure. But if there are going to be these gaping holes, well, that's pretty difficult, isn't it? That's pretty difficult. Think of when we had the, the baptism of a little one. And a very, very important part of that, of course, is, is the whole business of parents making promises. It falls on the congregation too, but promising a faithful and steady example. These men were to set an example, but add to that, um, to be an example, I want to make the point, we, we need to, to, to watch ourselves. We watched a film. Um, it's a story I did, didn't know anything about, but the, the, the film really was the story of, the, of, of what happened in the early 60s. The, the story, true story, of um, two men, really. Uh, Grenville Wynne, who was a British businessman, and a man called Oleg P uh, Penkovsky, a, 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 a Russian colonel, I think he was, who passed on secrets to the West. Um, and in passing on um, secrets, he uh, really probably saved us from some measure of destruction in, in the whole Cuba crisis. Um, Penkovsky would lose his life for that, and Revel Wynne was in a Russian jail for 18 months before finally he was released. Um, Remarkable acting, remarkable acting, a remarkable performance. Um, and, and you're always struck, you know, you watch people act and, and so on. We understand it's acting, and, but when they can make themselves cry, I think, well, that's amazing, that's, that's, that's stunning. But acting out, um, uh, you know, an example, just acting out an example, just being an actor, as the, you know, the, the tragic story of the Pharisees was, simply being actors on the stage, well, that's a, that's a tragedy, and ultimately it will show itself hollow. And, and so it will in Christian circles too. If you're just going to act it out, ultimately you can try and cover it over, you can try and do this, and you can... 
uh, persuade people that you're, you're the real McCoy and so on, ultimately people will see through that. And really your authority, your witness, your testimony will be gone. Here's uh, Paul writing to Timothy, the passage that we read earlier. Um, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 15, meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Timothy was a, to apply himself to the truth. He was a, to apply himself to God's word that his progress was evident, manifest, that people would see that he loved the word, that he enjoyed the word, that he delighted in the word, that he followed the word. They were to, to follow. Follow your leaders, follow their leadership, but follow their leader. The right book of Hebrews is stirring his readers to follow the example of faith that had been set, but notice please that he's not pointing them ultimately to men, but to the Lord Jesus. And ultimately, of course, men will fail Men will fail. What is man? His breath is in his nostrils, we're told. Think of, um, you know, the Old Testament. And time and again, you see these wonderful figures fail. Even Moses fails. Joshua gets it wrong. Abraham fails. David fails. Solomon fails. Why? Well, it's not part of that to remind us that man is man. But of course, ultimately, uh, these men were pointing to the Lord Jesus. And, and that really is the significance of what we've got in, in verse eight. I know it's often taken as a standalone verse and I've got no problem with, with that. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. This is the outcome of their conduct. It's about Jesus Christ. It's not man, but the man. It's the God man. It's the Lord Jesus Christ who is the same yesterday, today and forever. Ultimately, it's that we look to him. And these people, these Hebrew Christians were being pointed back to him. This is the one that your leaders have been telling you about. This is the one that they've been preaching to you about. They, they've been bringing God's word and you need to fasten your hope and trust in him. Don't throw. <clears throat> this witness and testimony. Don't throw this example away. Realize they're pointing to the Lord Jesus. The message here is not one of looking to men. It's about looking to the Lord Jesus. They needed to draw on the Lord Jesus. And we've noticed already back in chapter 7, verse 23, where we read, um, but he, or verse 24, but he uh, continues forever as an unchangeable um, he has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to say to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. They were to look to the Lord Jesus. Life does change. You say, well, things aren't the same anymore. But Jesus Christ is the same. Jesus Christ is the same. We always need to look to him. You can get that in church life and <clears throat> churches can be in vogue and people want to be there and then they can lose that status and people don't want to be there. That can be for valid reasons. That can be for simply invalid reasons. It's just the, the fashions of men and, and, and so on. But our looking is not to, to popularity. It is to the person. It is to the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. What does the church teach? What does the church instruct? What are the leaders talking about? Whom are they pointing to? What's it all about? Well, says the writer book of Hebrews, they've been pointing you to, to Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus. He's the Savior, the, the eternal Son of God, who took our human form to become our Savior, Redeemer, and friend. And he's not changed. Be looking to him is the message that we need. What do we say? Well, are you a leader in some way or other in the life of the church? Be careful. Be careful. Example is everything. Example is everything. You have to set an example. Not something hollow, not something empty. 
not something fraudulent, not acting, not acting, but reality. Simple reality, not a performance. You know, we mentioned prayer, well, not a performance in prayer. Just reality. Just reality. And then look to that unchangeable saviour. The Christian life is tough. These folk had found it tough. The Christian life is tough. Um, to become a Christian doesn't mean to be spared trouble and disappointment uh, and even death. But we have an unchangeable saviour. An unchangeable friend. We need to be careful to enjoy him. Let's turn to God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word of truth. We thank you for the many, many times when we've heard your word. And for those that you've raised up to bring it to us, we pray that we would listen, that we would take in, that we would respect and not reject. We pray that above all, we would see the loveliness of the Lord Jesus the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ultimately, men change. Ultimately, men come and go. But he is the one who remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us to look to him, we pray. Part us now with your gracious blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.